They said different in every tongue, but he knows it when you call it. Amen? Amen. He knows his name, and I'm glad that I know his name. Uh, and also, I'm really glad that he knows mine. Amen? Because <laughs> that's what matters, uh, is that he knows mine. Amen? Uh, I want my name in that Lamb Book of Life. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Uh, we're going to be continuing a series we started and launched last Sunday uh, entitled Unshakable in a Shaking World. Unshakable in a Shaking World. Now, what this message and these string of messages are focusing on is on the 12th chapter of the book of Hebrews. And we're going to be going there today, so if you have your Bible, go ahead and get there, and I'll tell you what verse here in a minute. But we started off last week, and we talked about how we're living in a very shaken time right now, where everything that can be shaken is being shaken. The very even morals, cores, values, nations, systems, things of that nature, everything seems to be shaking. And not only are those things shaking in, the, in, a, in a kind of a, uh, economic and, and uh, political and things of that nature, but actually as the earth in elements and nature, things are happening all over the globe. Things are happening. But here's the thing. God put the church and invented the church and established the church on Jesus Christ to be unshakable in a shaking time. That's what we're called to be. We are called to be unshakable. Now, that doesn't mean we're never going to have bad times or we're never going to have times where we need help. But we as a people and as the body of Christ, we have to be unshakable more than ever in this day and hour because people are going to be looking for help. They're going to be looking for an answer. And the one place that needs to be stable among everything out there is the church because... One, it's founded on the Rock of Ages. One, it's founded on Jesus Christ, and He is unshakable, unfallible. We have the answer. We have what the world needs, but we cannot offer it to them if we're not being the stable church we're supposed to be. So that's what we're talking about in being becoming stable and becoming unshakable. This is where we get this message. It's in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 27 through 29. This is our, our text verse for this series. The Bible says this, and this word yet once more signified the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Yeah. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Yeah. When he began to write this, he began to talk about that they're in a place and there was a shaking, but it's shaking even more now. And we're living in a world that is shaking in sin, doubt, worry, fear, pain, hurt, you name it. It just goes on and on and on and on. The, the world is indeed shaking and the people in it are shaking. Yeah. But again, to, to make my point again, we're called to be unshakable. Yeah. That's why he said we're a part of a kingdom that's unmovable, yeah. that we are unshakable. But we have to be that. Yes. We can't just attend church and hope it happens. No. People are, have fallen into that trap all over the world. America has fallen into that trap. And you see the, the, the state of America. Right. Going to church doesn't cut it. I wish it did. No. Uh, I wish it did. Going to church and going to a building, that's amazing. Yes. We're called to gather ourselves together. That's awesome. But even the smallest of things that the church overlooks, the Bible says that when you see the day approaching, gather together together. In his name, in his name, we gather together in our own name. We gather together in our own hobby, our own entertainment, our own world. It's our church. It's not God's anymore. He's just the icon that we use. It's our way, our way, what we want to do. It's our type of Jesus, our type of belief. That's not unshakable. That can be shaken. What is unshakable is when it's God's church. Because nobody can move God. Amen. When God has stood firm, nobody can move him. Nobody can, can uproot him. So we have to look at keys to becoming the unshakable church. Last week we started in going through this chapter just verse by verse. We talked about Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. And we talked about how the first thing we have to do is lay aside every weight and lay aside every sin. And then we have to run with patience, the race. We talked about those are foundational things. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 through 4, I'm just giving you the recap. Uh, I'm getting to where we left off last week. Uh, so I'm hitting a lot of stuff fast. So don't worry. I will slow down in just a minute. Hebrews chapter 12, 2 verse 4. We talked about the next five, the next three things we had to do. One, look unto Jesus again. Stop yes. looking unto ourselves and stop looking unto society and the world for our answers. Look unto Jesus. 
Number two, we had to trust in what he has done for us. Yes. To trust in the redemption of Jesus Christ. To trust in the blood of Jesus to set us free again. That we don't need Jesus and something else. We just need Jesus. Right. Amen. Yes. Number five, don't become weary and faint by saying it's too hard. And that's where we left off last week. And I want to just kind of piggyback on that. We live in a world today where a lot of people, when you say, hey, you need to live right, you need to think right, you need to do right, you need to be holy. The first thing they say is, well, nobody can be holy. We can't ever do everything right. We can't do this. Yes, in theory, there's an ounce of truth to that. Are we going to be making mistakes? Sure we are. Are we, are we going to fall from time to time? Yes. That's why we live under grace, the dispensation of grace. But grace is not an excuse for us to willingly live in sin. That is a big misconception that's all over the world today. That grace gives us a free card to sin. No, it doesn't. If you go and read what grace is, the Bible defines grace as God gave us grace teaching us to deny ungodliness and to embrace true holiness. Grace is a teaching tool, just like we raise our children. When we raise our children, are they going to make everything right from the get-go? No, they are not. And I hate to burst your bubble if that's what you think of little Johnny or little Susie. They're not perfect. Uh, they make mistakes, uh, and, and they're going to make more of them. So understand, when we raise them, we give them grace. We understand there's a teaching session there that we teach them so that they don't make the same mistake on day one on, on day 35 or day 60 or whatever it may be. We teach them. It's the same thing God has instituted for his church. He knows that we're going to make mistakes. He gives us grace, but to teach us. There's a difference in making a mistake and living a habit. There is a difference. You can't say, oh, I made a mistake every time you sin against God. Because if it was a mistake, you repent of it, you understand that was wrong, and you change and you go a different direction. If it's a habit, it's, well, I did it again, and I did it again, and I did it again, and I did it again. That is an active uh, sign of disobedience. Amen. Can grace save you from disobedience? Yes. But you've got to make a point to repent, which means to turn around, to go a different way. Completely. Amen. So that's where we left off last week. So now we're going to pick up and go a little bit slower now. <laughs> I've been trying to fit all that in the first five minutes. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12. I want to read verse 5 through 11. We pick up and we're going to learn some more things. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5 through 11, he says this. And again, you understand, he's speaking to the church here. He's not speaking to the world. I've always said, I expect sinners to be sinners. I expect sinners to not know the will of God and not execute it. I expect that from them. I was once a sinner. I knew that. I was good at sinning. We all are. Amen. You want to know how good you are at sinning? Just be yourself. You'll get there. Amen. Uh, amen. Because we have a sinful nature. We have this flesh. And if you follow that, you're going to end up in sin. That's why we have the Spirit of God. That's why we have a, a soul that's led by the Holy Spirit of God. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5 and 11 says this. And ye have forgotten that the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children, my son. Despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God deal with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then ye are bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they barely for a few days chastening us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening for the present seems to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Now, I'm going to talk about three more steps of how become, the church has to become unshakable. Starting with this one. Stop avoiding correction and conviction. The church has slowly, in America, moved away from these two words. Correction and conviction. We don't want people feeling bad. We want everybody to come in and have smiles from the time they come until the time they go home. We don't want anybody to be challenged. We don't want to step on any toes. When you begin to lay these guidelines out in the church, you remove the word of God. Right. You have no other choice but to. 
Because the Bible says the Word of God is good for exhortation, direction, correction, yes. discipline, discipleship. Yes. It's good for that. You can't preach the Word of God and still say, but we don't want anybody to be mad. We don't want anybody to be challenged. We don't want, anybody, we don't want to tell anybody they can't do something. So let's just not go there. Let's just talk about peace and happiness and joy and, you know, and living the best you can today because you never know what tomorrow. Yeah, that sounds good and it's fluffy and it's nice, but it will not save a sinner. It will not get people to Christ. It will not get people to Calvary. It will not change their heart or their soul. You have to present the Word of God. And when you present the Word of God, it corrects. Amen. There's a reason why it's called a sword. Amen. Swords do what? They cut stuff. Amen. Nobody puts their kid to bed with a sword. Nobody tucks their kids in at night with a sword. Why? Because it's not meant for that. Amen. Nobody has ever given somebody a, 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 a pep talk using a sword. Nobody has ever uh, said, well, come over here. I know you're upset, but come over here and cry with me and pat them on the back with a sword. No one has ever done that. No. There's a reason why the word of God is called a sword. God didn't make a mistake. He didn't throw that in there because it sounds fancy. He said it because that's what it means and that's what it represents. And it's the best way we can understand the word of God. The word of God cuts it cuts the junk out of your life. It cuts all the stuff that's useless out. It cuts out the sin. It cuts out the rebellion. It cuts all that stuff out. That is surgery. Surgery is not pleasant. Amen. Amen. Surgery is not pleasant. Some things have to die. Flesh has to die. Its ways have to die. But if you begin to bring correction and conviction away from the message of preaching and teaching the gospel, if you eliminate it completely... What you have is something that looks like the church, but does not behave like the church. Amen. 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 Because on the inside, they're still heathens. And I mean that, not, I, I was called a heathen all the time when I was a kid. Uh, I was a heathen, and I lifted up. <laughs> it was justified. I was a heathen. Uh, heathens are somebody who just does not listen. They just disobey and go against the grain all the time. That's what the church does today. And anytime someone begins to challenge them and say, hey, you know what? You can't just do everything and go to heaven. Well, you're judging me. No, I'm not. I'm not judging you at all. I didn't write this stuff. God wrote this stuff. Amen. Now, if I had my own book and I said, these are the laws of Chad Kirk, and I preached them and taught them, I would be judging you. But this is the word of God. Yes. The word of God. And it's powerful. Amen. And it divides. And it cuts asunder. And it leads all the way down into the intentions of your heart. Amen. This is why when Jesus began to present the law, they never understood it. Because he didn't just present the letter of the law. He, he, he presented the intention of the law. The spirit of the law. And they were like, well, what do you mean? I didn't call this guy. He's like, no, but I'm telling you, if you lust in your heart. After that woman, you've committed adultery. All the Pharisees looking around at each other. What? That, that's not in there. Amen. But it is in there. It's the spirit of the law. This is why we've got to get back to doing it the way Jesus did it. If you begin to teach and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're going to get convicted. Because there's a lot of messed up stuff in here that has to be corrected. It doesn't mean you're going to die and go to hell and you're an awful person. No, it is for correction. It's so that you're not the same Christian five years from now that you are today. Because if you are, something's wrong. Something's messed up. Something is not right. I know we have you know, the saying in the good old church of God, save, sanctify, fill with the Holy Ghost. That's great, but you still got to grow you All still right. got to keep on growing. And, and, it, and it's about daily correction and daily conviction. And we ought to pray and ask God, please, God, search my heart. Yes. If there's any yes. wicked yes. thing in me, God, yes. please cut it out of me. Yes. Yes. But instead, we have a church that's willing to walk so close to sin without getting anyone. Right. Yeah. That's not a st stable church. It's not a stable environment for anyone. So we've got to stop avoiding correction. I say it this way. Don't play spiritual dodgeball. What I mean is when I'm preaching or teaching or whoever you're sitting under is preaching and teaching, don't always be like, well, that wasn't for me, and that wasn't one for me, and that wasn't for me, and that wasn't for me. Amen. If nobody's ever preached a sermon to you your whole life, you're an expert at dodgeball. Amen. Because sometimes God's going to get you. 
Sometimes He's going to preach to your heart. Sometimes He's going to convict you to where you're sitting upright but you feel this small. It's not a bad thing. I'm going to get to that. Understand, number seven, we've got to get to the next part. Understand that it's tough, but it's for our own good. Used to be a thing called tough love. Anybody ever heard that before growing up? Tough love. Anybody ever experienced tough love? Amen. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, I've experienced that too. Uh, tough love. It means, you know what? It's that old saying, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you kind of thing. Those kind of moments, God has those moments. God says, this is going to hurt you. But no, it hurts me more than it hurts you. When God brings correction and conviction, yes, there is a season of pain. Pain for your flesh, but freedom for your soul. Pain for your flesh, but freedom for your soul. This flesh doesn't like being corrected. This flesh doesn't like it. Doesn't like tough preaching. Doesn't like it. It doesn't want to hear it. I do everything right. Who are you to judge me? You don't know my life. You don't know where I'm from. You don't know my circumstances. We can preach that to each other till we're blue in the face. But God knows where you stand with Him. God knows right now where you stand with Him. He knows the last time you prayed. He knows the last time you read your Bible. He knows the last time you thought of Him. He knows everything about you. It's not about what I know or what I see. It's about what God already knows. And if God is going to get you from where you are to where He wants you to be, there's going to be some tough love involved. It's going to cause some sacrifice. It's going to have to be laying down some things, some changing of attitude, changing of perspective. Maybe asking you to do some things that you never, maybe never wanted to do before. Maybe God may say you need to forgive someone that you, you're still holding your grudge to. Maybe you need to go apologize. Maybe you need to give something back. I don't know. God has a million different ways that he does this, but whatever it is, be obedient to it and yeah, it's going to hurt for a minute but it's for our good. Yes. If we could get that explained again across the world that preaching and teaching the gospel does good more than it does harm. Yes. I've heard so many people where you can't preach it like they used to because you'll hide in church where nobody. Everybody will leave. They'll go down to the church around, around town that to, to, they don't feel bad. That's fine. I don't want anybody to leave. I'm not trying to run anybody off this morning. But listen, I'd rather have a church of two that are saved and ready to meet with Jesus than have a church of 2,000 that are going to miss it and split hell wide open because they're playing church. Amen? Amen. You've got to get back to preaching and teaching the Word of God and let the chips fall where they may. When people really love Jesus and really want to grow in Jesus, they will be drawn to it. Then we go embrace it and say, I like that. I want that. It makes me feel like God is talking to me. It makes me feel like I have a relationship with God. Because he says in there, he says, I don't have a child that I don't rebuke, rebuke or chasten. Or even he said, or scourge. Woo. I don't know if you know what that means. But when they scourged Jesus Christ, they whipped him with a cat of nine tails. Now nobody I know is praying, God... Hey, take me in the shed and really whip me good. <laughs> Nobody's praying that. But it might do us some good. Then he begins to give us why. Well, I always want to explain the why. Why does it have to be this way? One, you've got to have it because it, it, it increases growth. Number eight, more correction equals more fruit. I'll, I'll read it to you again. He says, but he says, but, but any chastening is grievous for the present time. Uh, it doesn't seem to be joyous, but, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness. The peaceable fruit of righteousness. The more correction God does in your life, the more fruit you can bear. The more fruit you can produce. The more productive you can be in the kingdom. So don't think the ones that are in front of people, the ones that have position, the ones that do that, that they got everything right and they got it all under control. No, it usually means they're corrected more than most. Because it's daily correction. It's daily under the, 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 uh, the watchful eye of God. It's daily on the threshing floor being, uh, being uh, stomped out so that the good can arise and the bad can go away. It's a daily, a seizing thing. It's one of those type of things. But those people God used beyond measure because they can produce a lot of fruit. If you want to be productive in the kingdom of God, don't try to get as good as you can. Try to go to God and let Him get out all the bad you can. Amen. Let him get out all the attitudes. Let him get out all those things. The little hang-ups. Now, I'm not telling you that all the things God's going to remove from you are sin. 
Because correction can be, yeah, from sin, but correction can also be from attitude. Things that are not expedient for you. Things that are not helpful for you along your way. So don't think that the bar is, well, it's not sin. No, we, we do that and we, we mess up. Well, you didn't say. You ever had a kid, you tell them to do something? Take out the garbage. They take out the garbage, they put it on the side of the curb, don't put it in the can. <laughs> you go out there and you say, I thought I told you to take out the garbage. I did. You didn't put it in the can. You didn't say to put it in the can. You just said to take out the garbage. We do that to God all the time. But you didn't say, I can't find in the Bible where it says thou shalt not, or thou shalt, or whatever. You didn't say God. You just said this. Is it coming home yet? You understand this is how the world ha has messed up the gospel and messed up Jesus Christ and messed up a path to God and made it so difficult. When you begin to just simplify and understand that correction is a part of God's love, it's a part of his way, it's a part of him expressing to you just how much he cares about you, that he loves you enough to correct you. He even put it in Proverbs this way. We say it all the time. He that spoils the rod, uh, uh, spares the rod, spoils his child. But the actual biblical version is he who spares the rod, hateth his child. Mm -hmm. all right. If you don't correct your children, it's a sign you hate them. Because if you really love them, you would correct them. You make sure they have obedience. You make sure that they understood how to be subject under authority. You would make sure these things. God is the ultimate father. He put all of this in position. He's going to love us, but yes, he's going to correct us because there'll be more fruit to gain from it. I want our church to be so fruitful. I want God to be able to use us so mightily, not just for our own city, but around the world. I want God to be able to use us. So what has to happen? We've got to embrace correction. We've got to understand there's some things we've got to cut away. There's some things we've got to, to be before God and be open and plain and not try to say, well, I don't have to do this. The Bible doesn't say this. Or no, if it's good, if it's something God can use, then embrace it. If it's something that gets in the way, then let it go. Because we have to be the, sta the stable church in this last day. Let's move on to Hebrews chapter 12, verses 12 and 13. Now, that was the rough part. Here's going to be the shouting part, so get ready. Okay? All right. Hebrews 12, 12 to 13. It says, Wherefore, lift up your hands, which hang down, and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. What does he mean by wherefore lift up the hands which hang down? Get a new grip and strengthen your stance. Yes. Get a new grip. When he says strengthen your hands which hang down, basically defeated. You're defeated. You ever seen anybody who's down and depressed? It's always like this. Uh -huh. Everything's always hanging down. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Charlie Brown mode. <laughs> you remember Charlie Brown? Heads always like this. Charlie Brown mode. We've got a lot of saints that that's what they're in. They're hanging down. Everything's hanging down. Everything's down. Hey, you talk to them. Hey, how's your day? It's been down. It's been down. How's your health? It's been down. How's your walk with God? It's been down. Everything's down. What God's saying here, you've got to get a firm grip again on God. We like to pinky with God. Come here, Cubby. He's got to get behind his equipment. He didn't know I was going to use it. Get up here. This is the way we like to walk with God. You see me? This. This is the way we want to walk with God. You know why? Because we're like, well, God, you've got this little part of my life. You've got Sunday morning. But all this is me. And anytime I want to go this way, I can go. And if it comes to it to where God's pulling too hard on this pink, I can go, oh, okay. I'll do my own thing. When it says strengthen your hands, it means get a firm grip on God again. Firm grip on the earth. A firm grip on holiness. A firm grip on righteousness. On what's right and what's wrong. And walk with that grip and don't let go. That's the way the church has to become with God again. Amen. That's what it means to get a firm grip because I can't get away from this. He can't get away from this. I want this. This is the way God has to be in your life. Can't just be strutting around and let go whenever. Get a firm grip yeah. on God. Yeah. Thank you, bud. Sure. He's going to complain about that after church again. <laughs> <laughs> Squeeze me too hard. 
Get a grip on the things of God again. Because the church, not I breaks my heart to say it, but the church and ministers throughout, and I'm not trying to badmouth any minister. I know I got my own faults and I'm not the best at it. I do my best. But understand, ministry has lost its grip yes. on God. Yes. Lost its grip on the word. Lost its grip on the heart and the move of God. It's lost its grip because it's wanted to be like Starbucks. It's wanted to be like the mall. It's wanted to be like the theater. It's wanted to be like all the world attractions. And it was never meant to be that. Amen. We were a part of the place that God set up that people could escape the world. Yes. Not that they could come here and find a little of it in here. All right. Amen. We're the people where they come to be peculiar. Right. We're the odd ones. We don't fit into this world. We're just passing through. Amen. All right. yes. Get a firm grip and strengthen your stance. Yes. The church has to strengthen its stance again against sin, against shame, against things that are plainly wrong. And stop inching back up anytime the world pushes. Well, this is wrong. Well, you can't preach about that. You'll offend people. Okay, well, then I'll back up a little bit. You can't say that. I don't mess up with people. Well, you can't say that. that my granddad has that. Or my son's going through that, so you can't preach that. We're getting ourselves further and further back to where we can't preach anything anymore. Amen. Other than one thing that makes people happy. God loves you. Yeah. He loves you. And you see a lot more of that. Does, does it need to be preached? Need to be said? Absolutely, it does. We need to tell the world that God loves them. But if we just tell them that they love that He loves them, and that's it, we're setting them up for a rude awakening and a rude disappointment when they leave this planet. Because they're going to say, "Well, I thought God loved me." Well, He does. But it's not about just Him loving you. You got to fall in love with Him. Jesus said it this way. He said, if you love me, keep my commands. Take my correction. Take it. Don't run from it. Get a stance again. Stand for something. Amen? The church has stopped standing for anything. And the thing is, because we can't come out of aisle with it anymore. We've got one church that stands against this, but the other church across town saying, oh, they're just being radical. You don't have to worry about that. Can I tell you that's confusion? And can I tell you the Bible says God's not the author of it? God's not the author of it. God said his word is so simple that not even a fool could err therein. If we get back to preaching and teaching the word, it doesn't matter what denomination we are. It doesn't matter whether it's Pentecost, Methodist, Baptist, whatever it is. It don't matter. If we would get back to preaching and teaching the word of God and saying this is what you got to do. You got to stand for right. You got to abhor wrong. You got to get away from it. You got to stop it and shun it and not let it get root in your life. If we start preaching and teaching the word, the church could arise and be more fruitful than it's ever been. But we got to do it. And I can't control whatever other church does. And, and I can't even control what this church does. But as for me and my house, right. we want right. to do it right. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Get a firm grip. Strengthen your stance. Strengthen your feeble knees. Feeble knees mean they're about to give way. Uh -huh. I'm tired of Christians that are about to give way in the sin as soon as they hit the world on Monday. They come in here and shout and hoop and holler and say everything awesome yeah. and everything's great and God's my Savior and He's my deliverer and He's awesome and mighty. As soon as they get out into the world, their knees, oh, oh, I'm going down, I'm going down. And by Wednesday, they're lost as they ever were. Strengthen. Stand up. Get rooted down. Get rooted in God. Get rooted and grounded. Study to show yourself approved. Yes. Do these things. Yes. Number 10, make clear your direction in life. Yes. That's when he talks about make straight paths for your feet. Mm -hmm. Make clear your direction. Yes. Where are you going in life? When your goals and your achievements in life are, I want to have this much money in the bank so I can retire. I want to do this and I want to go here and I want to see that. And I want to do this and I want to be here. And I'd really love to enjoy this. And this is that. And your whole bucket list has nothing to do with your faith, right. your maturity in God. Your direction is on the wrong path and you're heading the wrong way. Right. There used to be a time where we had spiritual goals. 
that we wanted to achieve with spiritual direction in mind. Amen. Was a time when it wasn't, and I'm glad and I'm super proud of my son. He's going to Houston, going to be an architect. Super proud of him. But I pray more for his soul than I do for his education and his career. Amen? Because he can go be the best architect in the world that the world's ever seen. But if he dies and goes to hell, I have failed as a father and I have failed as a minister. The most important thing to me is my family knows Jesus. That they know Jesus. And I see the steps of them knowing Jesus. I begin to see the fruit of them knowing Jesus. I'm not going to assume just because I drag them here every Sunday that they're good. Because they, they aren't. There's a lot of times I'm like, Lord, I, they need to get saved. They need to give their life over to you. Knowing dad and knowing dad knows Jesus isn't enough. And I tell them all the time, you've got to have a relationship with God. You've got to pray. You've got to read your Bible. It's up to you. You can't get to heaven on, on my merit or on grandma's merit or on the North Gate Church of God merit. You can't do it. You've got to know Jesus Christ. You've got to make that choice. And you've got to pursue it. I'm here. Everybody's here to help and aid along the way. But we can't do it for you. You've got to make a clear direction in your life. And if your clear direction is pointed at Jesus, you're going to succeed in a lot of things. Because Jesus said it. He said, hey, put the kingdom and its righteousness first. And I'll add all this other stuff to you. I'll add everything you ever want. Architecture is what my son's into. Kobe, if you want to be a good architect, follow the architect of the ages. He put the whole world in plan. He put it together in its purpose. And it's worked forever. Because he doesn't make mistakes. Add God into your dreams. Add God into your goals. Add God into what you're doing in life. Let Him be a priority again in your life. It's amazing we make God a priority on Sunday, but we forget Him every other day. If we're going to be what we're called to be and be stable, the church has to get its direction back again. Because we've got some churches that are going the direction of the world. And some are going here and some are going over there. But we need to start saying our direction is one way. To heaven. To Jesus. To God. To your soul being set free. I'm not concerned if you're entertained. I'm not concerned if you're happy. I'm not concerned if everything was peachy keen this morning. And everything went your way. Or the temperature is perfect. Or the cushions are nice. Or the carpet is awesome, or the screen was bright enough where it's not, or the parking was awesome or not. we got to stop getting into that junk and say we're here for one goal. We're here to get people to heaven. We're here to get people to Jesus. If we can get them to Him, He'll take care of the building. He'll take care of the rest. But if we've got to get them to Him first. That's how you become a stable church. That's how you become a church where people can come and they can say, I'm messed up. My life is messed up. And we can say, well, join the crowd. We're all messed up in here too. But at least we're going the right way. Yes. Amen. I'm going to keep going. I got, well, no, no. <laughs> I don't want to dig in that and try to speak to her. I'm going to come to a close. Is this where you come play for me? The church, and I say the church, and when I say the church, I mean our church, but the whole church around the world, covering every continent, every denomination, whoever is born again, blood bought by Jesus Christ. The church. The church should be one of the most mighty, influential things on the planet. Should be. We can't, at one time we probably were. But a lot's changed. And what hasn't changed is the world. The world still does worldly things like it always has. So we can't say, well, the world's just gotten too dark. And the world's just gotten too black. The Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. Our sins are called different things, but they existed from the dawn of man. Sin is sin. It all comes down to three things. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, pride of life. Any sin you want to talk to, you dig long enough and you're going to get to one of those three. It's what the devil uses. It's what he used in Adam and Eve. It's what he used to try to use it on Christ. Those three things. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, pride of life. He's been doing the same thing all the time. So it's nothing new. So if the world has not stopped being the world and it's still the same old world, 
then what has changed? Because God hasn't changed. He's the same old God. He says, I change not. I'm forever. So we know it's God hasn't changed. His power hasn't changed. The blood hasn't changed. Jesus hasn't changed. The Holy Ghost hasn't changed. Well, there's only one more agent in the dilemma. It's the church. It's the church. If the church would get back to being what God asked the church to be, nothing more, nothing more, just being the church, God could shake this earth again. The power of the Lord. He could shake this nation again. He shook this nation before. Some of you are probably old enough to remember it. When God shook the nation. When God poured out His Spirit in tents and things. And people saw miraculous healing and everything. And there was a time where politicians were afraid of the church. Because the church had power. Now they laugh at us and call us crazy. What's happened? We've changed. And I don't want to blame it on anybody here. I'm not trying to place blame on any generation. But over the years... By one, by one, by one, we've compromised and compromised and compromised and backed up and backed up and made it comfy and make it comfortable. Don't preach against this. Don't do that. You won't have a church big. You won't have a lot of people. You won't be popular. And we back ourselves into a corner and now the world is falling apart and the church has no answer. Because the church can't be the church. You can't introduce people to Jesus if you don't know him yourself can't introduce people to the power of God and grace that transforms their life if you can't have it yourself. So, it's up to us. It's up to us. You say, well, how in the world can we change the whole world? I don't know. Well, we can start with just our own friends, our own family, our own places of business, our own schools. Right here in Victoria, we can start with just who we are and start being the church start getting on our knees and start praying God bless me, bless me and saying God convict me, correct me correct me God, correct my mind correct my heart, bring down judgment upon me so that I can grow and so that I can be a blessing to other people if you do that, God will answer because believe me, that's not a prayer he hears a lot he's filled up all day with the bless me bunch bless me, bless me, bless me not too much of God search me. Search the heart. Search the reins of my heart, God. Create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me, God. So that I can be a blessing to other people. That's what we got to get back to. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads this morning. Every head bowed, every eye closed. No one looking around. I want to ask you this morning. Now, I'm not going to come back there. I'm not going to jerk you up here. I'm not going to do anything like that. If you want to come up here to these uh, steps, there are altars. You can pray. You're more than welcome to do so. But what I want to know right now is I just want you to be honest with God. How many steps of what we've been talking about are you saying, you know what? I'm not living that step. I should be, but I'm not. That one I've kind of let slip. I'm not here to judge or condemn. That's not what I'm doing. This is that part where we talk about God loves us. Correction. Conviction. If God has loved you enough to convict you or to correct you this morning, then right where you are, will you just put your hand up and put it right back down? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God loves us so much. He loves us so much. Let's pray. And let's not run against it. Let's not try to justify it. But let's just yield to it. Let's just say, God, here I am. Move upon me. Change my heart. Change my direction. Change my everything. As long as it points me in your direction. It gives me a firm grip on you again. Not just a light pinky hold, but a firm grip on the, God, on the God that I know. The God of the Word. Can we do that this morning? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I want a firm grip. God, I know, Lord, from time to time, Lord, I have distanced myself. God, I'm not perfect. I know, Lord, there's times where I have not acknowledged you when I should have. God, I want a firm grip. I want us to be close. God, I want us to pull each other tight. God, the, the Lord said so we're so close and so tight that they don't know where you stop and where I begin. God, I want to have that kind of relationship with you. God, I want us to be one the way Jesus prayed that we would be one. God, I want 
conviction and correction in my life. I want you to convict me. I want you to turn my heart back to you. I want you to daily find things in me to perfect me. Prune me, God. Cut away the things that don't belong so that only you remain and only things that are productive to you remain. God, help me to put my direction towards you always. Lord, to put my goals, my path, my hopes, my dreams on you always. Lord, so that I can be the person you call me to be. So I can be a part of this church that is going to be stable. God, that's going to be unshakable in this last hour. God, it can be a place where the broken can come and find a healer. Lord, where they can come and find redemption. Where they can come and find help. Lord, that's what we want to be. That's what our heart is. And God, I pray that we have fulfilled your will this morning. God, I thank you for every person in this place, every person watching on Facebook. I thank you, God, this morning. And I ask you to bless us, Lord, and help us as we go, as we depart. Help us in Jesus' holy name. And everyone said amen and amen and amen. Thank you guys so much for being here. We're going to continue with this. This is why I want to take my time. I don't want to just cut and hit high points. I want to take our time. I really, 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 and I'm not just saying this to sound whatever. I really, really feel like this is a right now word, not just for this church, but for churches. Because it's, I don't want to get gloom and doom, but the world is about to see some things. And I'm not a prophet. I haven't had a vision or a dream. I just feel it. The world is going to experience some things that this world's not ready for. And it's going to cause chaos, and it's going to cause hurt, and it's going to cause pain, and there's going to be a lot of doubt and a lot of fear. And the one place that's got to be ready to say we're here and we have the answer is the church. The church has to be ready to say we've got the answer. His name is Jesus. Amen? That's what we're preparing for. That's what this whole message is for. It's so that we as Victoria, that we can't say when it happens, well, we didn't know. No, we know. We heard. We know, God, you told us. Be ready, because it's coming. Amen? Amen? Amen. Guys, before you leave, before we pray a prayer dismissal, I do want to let you know that uh, this upcoming week, Tuesday night, 6.30 to 8, we have Celebrate Recovery. Uh, Celebrate Recovery is an amazing, amazing uh, mission, really, uh, for those that are dealing with anything, anything, anything from addictions, habits, hurts. If you're dealing with anything, and we all deal with stuff, you're welcome to come to Celebrate Recovery. We're going to feed you a meal where you're going to hear some ways to see where you can overcome those little things. Nothing's too small, nothing's too big. If it is bothering you, come to Celebrate Recovery, and you can find recovery through Jesus Christ. It's every Tuesday, 6.30 to 8. Uh, come and be a part of that. I encourage you. Wednesday, we do Bible study right here uh, in, in the sanctuary from 7 to 8 o'clock. You're more than welcome to come to be a part of it. What we've been going through, we've been, we're halfway through. Uh, we're going to be picking back up uh, the things that are destroying Christianity. Things that the church is doing right now that is destroying Christianity as we know it. We already went over two. We're going to go over two more. Come back for that. Be a part of that. You say, well, I'm going to you know, be gone or out of town. Watch us on Facebook. We put everything on Facebook. That way you don't have to miss anything. Go to our Facebook page. Northgate Church. Find it. It's on Facebook. You can watch it. We also have a YouTube channel. We put all of our messages on Go to YouTube and watch everything we've had forever. <laughs> it's all on there. So go to YouTube and you can watch to your heart's content. But be a part of what God is doing because I think God is doing something very special with this church. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads and pray a prayer of dismissal and then we'll be on our way. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word today. It's truth. Lord, I pray that we embrace it. We don't forget it. Lord, as we go out of these walls, let us live it. Don't let us forget you and drop you off at the door. God, let us carry you all week long. God, and help us to grow and be strong. Bring us back to the next point in time. Lord, and as we gather together, always we pray that your presence meet us here. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Guys, shake hands, be friendly. Thank you so much for coming this morning. Have a blessed week.